I'm Crystal Keating, and this is the Johnny and Friends Ministry Podcast. Each week, we're bringing you real conversations about disability and finding hope through hardship and sharing practical ways that you can welcome and include people impacted by disability in your community. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss any of our encouraging conversations. You can also find all of the resources we've talked about at johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast. As parts of our country begin lifting social distancing restrictions, I've invited Dr. Rebecca Dyer back to the podcast to talk about inclusion. As a professor at Grand Canyon University with 18 years of experience in special education, Dr. Dyer is sharing her passion for including and integrating kids with disabilities at church and the model that she uses to impact the next generation to catch the vision for inclusion. Moving beyond the classroom and partnering with churches to provide hands-on special needs education. Well, Rebecca, it's so great to talk to you again, and thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I am so interested to hear more of your story and how you became so passionate about inclusion, especially in the body of Christ during the times churches gather for worship services or other times of fellowship. I mean, I'm so curious to know how you began working as a special education teacher, and then how did you transition to ministry? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for having me today. It's definitely been an interesting journey, but I love looking back at it and just seeing how God has been working through all of it. Um, I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. And when I took kind of the first intro to special education course, I had a fabulous instructor who himself had a disability and he had also adopted two girls that had disabilities. And he was very Mm. passionate about, you know, everything special education, the law, rights, and how to provide supports and inclusion for individuals with disability. So that really inspired me to become a special education teacher. And I started teaching. And after a couple of years, the church I was going to had a need for a children's pastor. So I took that on part-time. And as I was um, getting going in that ministry, I had a mom who was coming to church and she was going through a divorce at the time. She had a son um, who had autism and she had tried bringing him to church before I was there and was not successful. Mm -hmm. And she came to me pretty, you know, um, emotional and and stressed just with everything that was going on. And she said, I just, I need to be able to go to church, but I can't do that if I don't know if that my son is being taken care of and supported. And she knew I had this special education background. I said, okay, well, we will figure it out. (laughs) Um, Because it was new to me too, um, taking that aspect of special education and you know, bringing it to church, but it was great because he was successful and he was able to attend all the children's programming while she, she, she could go be loved on and minister to with everyone else. And then it's just continued to kind of come together that those two pieces of my life, because I then took some of that when I decided to do my dissertation on disability ministry, looking at that aspect of inclusion and what it looks like in churches as well. Well, yeah, you've probably seen the education model and then various models of inclusion within the church. You Mm -hmm. know, I'm curious to know, what would you say are some of the barriers you've identified that churches and classrooms face when opening their doors to children, youth, and adults with disabilities? Well, I try to think about, you know, the, the purpose of the church, and that's obviously to communicate that unconditional love to everyone that comes in through their doors. And I think the churches, for the most part, it's not intentional. They're not, you know, looking to have those barriers, but they really have to take a step back and look at what are some things that are maybe preventing these individuals from coming into our church? Um, I think they, what that's really important that they put themselves in their shoes. Okay, if I were going to church and I either had a disability or have a child with a disability, what would I need? What would I want, need it to look like and sound like? So I think it's really important for churches to be proactive in communicating that. Hey, here's what we've done to make sure we can support you and we want you to feel welcomed and valued here. 
sharing, hey, we've trained our volunteers and our staff on how to work with your children. We have sensory items or different things that your child can use to communicate here. And one thing that obviously is very important is that physical accessibility. Mm. Um, And if you don't have a disability, right, it's hard to really think about that. So you have to kind of walk through your property in your buildings and say, is this really physically accessible for someone that might need something different? And then I like it when churches take the time to say, hey, here's how we're going to communicate the gospel and communicate Jesus' love to your child if, if it needs to be in a different way. Maybe we have a curriculum for them or we're going to adapt to this or that to make sure they still get that message because parents don't want just, hey, we have a place for them, but hey, how are they going to learn about Jesus while they're at church as well? Right. So that's really good. You're focusing on the physical barriers and Mm -hmm. removing those, but also the social and relational barriers that many of us, we just aren't aware of. Right. So that's really a good thing to be more cognizant of. You know, one of the interesting things that you talked about in our last conversation, which focused on autism and could be a potential barrier for churches engaging the way they want to, is that idea of, you know, children are going to come and maybe some with sensory processing disorders or autism might have behaviors that we don't know how to handle. And you made a great point about talking about that, that relational and friendship aspect of knowing the child, creating a sensory experience for them that's Mm -hmm. comfortable for them to kind of predict when they're going to have those behaviors and give them a spot where they feel comfortable and ready to learn. And, you know, someone asked a follow-up question to that, and I hope it's okay that I ask you this, but one of the questions was, how can someone working with a child with those sensory processing disorders or autism identify when the child is moving toward a behavior? Yeah, I really like this question because it focuses on being proactive versus reactive, which is really good. It's definitely going to be challenging, especially if the child is new to your program. But either way, if it's a new child or if someone that's been coming regularly, you want to be very observant because you want to see if you can pick up on any changes. So you're looking for has anything changed in their posture or how they're interacting with other people? So have they been in a group but all of a sudden withdrawn? Okay, mm. let's look at what did anything in their their environment change? Let's look at that. Has, does anything change in their voice? So mm. um, even if it's a child who maybe does not express themselves verbally, they may make some type of noises. So has anything changed with that? And then again, look at their environment and was there a reason for that change? Mm. And then of course, if they, you know, are starting to become physical, then we want to look at maybe what, what can we change in their environment or what has changed? I always um, encourage, especially if it's a new child, you want to, in most churches do, have some type of information card for them to fill out, but also just have a conversation with them and start it out positive and say, hey, tell me about your child. What do they like? What do they enjoy? Um, And usually that will also lead to, hey, is there anything we should know that should be avoided? Mm -hmm. And that way you can already kind of be on the lookout for those things. Mm -hmm. Um, If you can with a newer kiddo, have just one volunteer be with them. That way they can do a lot of observing and say, okay, I saw this change in the child. They became more, making more noises when another child approached them. Okay, mm. now I know that could be something that's going to escalate to a behavior. I'm going to make a note of that for next time, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's good. You have to be very aware and intentional in what you're looking for right. and being proactive. Well, what should be done to remediate a behavior if it does happen? This is really good to, you know, make sure you're prepared because it's still going to happen. We're going to have behaviors. And like you said earlier, this is something that really um, sometimes churches, you know, they don't know what to do. I think one of the most important things is keeping a calm and positive demeanor. So as the volunteer or whoever is working with them, you don't want to have an emotional reaction because that's what they were doing. So you have to say, okay, I'm going to you know, keep my voice the same. I'm going to be calm and, and keep everything positive. Depending on the behavior, you might need to start kind of steering. And when I say that, you know, without touching them, kind of getting them to move to somewhere where it's more secluded. Is this behavior causing danger or harm to themselves or to others? Mm. If it is, that's when you really want to try to steer them away. If it's not, 
you really don't need to intervene on the behavior. If they're in a safe place and they need to have that behavior, then let's let them have it. Now, as they're working through it, you can try asking questions. Make sure you have options, either verbal words or you use pictures or sign language or if you have a device for communication. You can offer something that maybe you know they like to do. You can try that. Mm -hmm. So if you have sensory items available, this might be a good time to pull some of those things. So if you have a weighted vest or blanket, maybe headphones, different fidget toys that you know they may like, you can offer those as well. But as you try these different strategies, if it's causing their behavior to escalate, you know, this is, again, you have to really observe, then you just back away. Again, as long as they're not harming themselves or others, give them a break, let them work through that behavior, and then maybe come back a few minutes later and try one of those strategies again, asking questions or offering something they like or a sensory item. That's the biggest thing is is when they're in that church setting, it's not like school, you know, where we're maybe working on behaviors. At right. church, we just want them to be comfortable mm. and safe. Mm. So if, if they need to do that behavior and they're okay, then we, we can be okay with it too. That's a great distinction that right. it's not a time necessarily of education or uh, behavioral therapy. Maybe they're doing that five days a week in other places. <laughs> True. And that makes a child feel loved and they can anticipate when I come here, someone's going to care for me. Someone's going to be particularly watching and removing stimulus that's bothersome and helping me to calm down. Right. So that's a big part of inclusion in a church. Why don't we talk about maybe the pros and cons of like a segregated disability ministry or specialized classroom for those with special needs? What are some of the benefits of having a particular place for children with disabilities? And then what are some of the great things also about including children in various activities where, quote, typical children are? Yeah, good question. And I love that a lot of different churches where I've done some observations are doing it very differently, and it seems to be very organic. Hmm. They kind of built their program as kiddos came to them and then looked at their needs and went from there. There's obviously a huge benefit to having kind of a separate or segregated ministry if needed. I've seen some specific classrooms for students who are medically fragile. So Hmm. obviously, we have to be very concerned about their medical state and making sure they're very safe. Usually we need more specialized volunteers in those rooms. So that's important to have a separate space for them. Also, if there are extreme behaviors, and a lot of times those settings are used just when needed, you know, maybe that Mm -hmm. kiddo is able to be included, but, oh, today we're having a little more of a rough day and we're starting to, you know, be harmful to other kiddos, then we're going to pull to another area where they can be successful, which is great. The big benefit I see of inclusion with the whole program, so I'm talking kids without disabilities, kids with disabilities, everybody together, is just that opportunity for social and communication skills Mm -hmm. to be developed and for them to see and um, to love on each other. It's so great Mm -hmm. to see the kids who don't have disabilities get so excited when their friends get to come and participate with them. It's it's beautiful, the, the relationships they can build. So that's obviously a huge benefit because they get used to feeling different and being mm-hmm. separated. Mm-hmm. So that feeling of, oh, I'm included and I'm going where everyone else goes, again, demonstrates love and, and you're valued and yeah, you're going to participate just like everyone else. Yeah, that is a powerful demonstration of the gospel that's included us into the family of God altogether, no matter the ability So what are some of the ways you've seen churches actually do this and work toward fully including individuals with disabilities? Good question, because it's so different depending on where you go. One church I've seen that's a very big church, they have multiple classrooms in the disability ministry program and kind of based on um, age and grade level. Hmm. And what they do is they take all those kiddos into, they have a giant room where all kids um, with and without disabilities do the music portion of the kind of program and also kind of a video lesson. And so they get to go in there. There are a lot of volunteers to support in there while they're in there. Mm. And then once that's over, they go back to their more individualized classroom where they repeat kind of the Bible lesson on their own level and do some type of activity 
and then, you know, play kind of time um, until their, their time is time to go home. Kind of a hybrid Um, model. Yeah. Which I really like because sometimes it's a little much, you know, to be Mm -hmm. with the other group the whole time. So they get the benefits of both. Another church I observed in that particular director, she does it differently for every kiddo, which I like too. So some of them, they're fully integrated for the whole service and some of them never make it in there because it is too much for them. Mm -hmm. And then there's everything in between. She has to have a lot of volunteers to go all those different directions Mm -hmm. all morning among the different services. In my particular church, we have a completely separate room just because of those kiddos' particular needs. But we are trying a little bit at a time going into the regular children's church as we can. You know, some days I can tell it's it's probably not going to happen today and that's okay because we're going to have a great time in our room. Yeah. So it sounds like flexibility is key. Yes, it's huge. Well, I love what you wrote when you said the need to minister to individuals with disabilities has been recognized from a theological perspective. Can you talk more about that theological perspective of inclusion? It's interesting when you um, have conversations with parents, they all have different viewpoints about their child and why their child has a disability and kind of what that means to me. Some of them look at it as a test of their faith Mm. or maybe they're being punished for some type of sin. um, And then some look at it as a gift from God. It's just going to be different for everyone, depending on their perspective and what they've experienced in their life. But we're all called to love one another. We're all made in the image of God. So I feel like that needs to be communicated to them that, yeah, your kiddo has something different, but so does every kid here. Mm -hmm. And we're going to value them and love them for everything that they are. So I think that speaks volumes to parents because a lot of parents come to church just hurt and kind of beat up and tired. They need to know that that extension of God's love goes to their child as well, even even though they may not have always experienced it that way. Right. And that's a big piece of disability is how it's impacting the parents. And, you know, one of the common responses we hear from parents of children with disabilities is they feel it's nonstop, it's isolating, Mm -hmm. we're exhausted. So how have parents of children with disabilities been ministered to by churches who have an inclusive kind of culture? Yeah, this is great when you can take the ministry and extend it from the kiddos to the parents and then even the whole family, providing respite, like you were talking about Mm -hmm. how exhausted they could be. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes that is hard to find people that can take care of their kiddos that are um, equipped and trained to do that. So providing opportunities for respite where, hey, you can drop your kiddos off at church for a few hours free of charge because sometimes money's an issue. Um, And then take that time and do with it what you need. Do you need to run errands? Do you need to go take a nap? Do you need to be with your spouse? What needs to happen? Mm -hmm. Um, That's huge. And then I've also seen, which I really like, is offering like classes and trainings for those parents because Mm. the world of special education is like a whole new world. There's new language. There's Mm. these programs and different organizations they need to, you know, connect with. So helping guide them through that is really helpful. And then I think it's also very beneficial to make a little, help them make little groups, you know, within their parenting groups of here's some other parents you connect with that have kids with disabilities because then they can relate to each other and grow in their faith together and love on each other that way. Oh, that's so good. And then parents at various stages within raising their children with disabilities can mentor one another, which is kind Mm -hmm. of a form of discipleship happening right there in those network groups. Right. And so you're getting to see the fullness of how God is caring for these families in a spiritual way, physically, um, emotionally, and relationally, which it allows parents to be more open to the word of God, to Mm -hmm. fellowship. I think that was God's intention for sure. Yes. You know, I also appreciate something you talked about, the idea of acceptance. You know, inclusion Mm -hmm. is a big deal, but also acceptance. You wrote, many families of children with disabilities seek support from a faith community more than anything else in their community. Their priority in seeking a church is not always a place where they feel they can grow spiritually, but rather a place that will accept their child. And Mm -hmm. so even, you know, in this day and age where we're thinking about COVID-19 and if we look towards the future and we think about opening up our country and gathering once again, 
I just think this idea of acceptance is that much more important. What do you think about that? I agree. That's very powerful for parents. I always say when someone loves my kids, you know, they'll say, I love your son. Or, you know, I'm like, well, I love you then because (laughs) those are my babies. So yes, I agree. Um, And there was a, one of the families I kind of worked with when I was doing my research, I interviewed them about their experience and they attended a previous church years ago that when their child was pretty young and the the diagnosis of autism was new to them. And the husband and wife, as we often do, were processing that information very differently Mm -hmm. and working through that. And then as the child was getting older, behaviors were becoming more severe. They actually received a letter from the church saying, you know, we can't have you bring your child to church anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my, (laughs) that is very powerful, you know, for someone to just flat out say your child's not accepted here. Mm -hmm. And then that led to them both struggling in their faith in their marriage, et cetera. Thank goodness they were able to find a church that loved on their kiddo eventually. And then a lot of that was restored, but um, that's very powerful to parents. I mean, obviously their child is a big part of their life and they love them. So Mm -hmm. they want someone to see that too, you know, see the great things about their kid. For sure. When we think about the gospel, we are accepted in the beloved Jesus Christ and we are Mm -hmm. accepting of one another in that same way. And right. those are things that God's spirit has to work in our hearts to really accommodate and to include. And may God help each of us to grow more like Jesus Christ in that way. And Dr. Rebecca Dyer, you have made such a neat transition. You were in special education and then you worked Mm -hmm. as a children's ministry pastor. And now you've made it all the way back to education. You are working (laughs) at Grand Canyon University. Talk about your role there. Yes, I I love being there and I love what I'm doing. So I work with um, students who are working towards becoming special education teachers So they're passionate about working with students with disabilities. I mean, I did that myself. I worked in a self-contained classroom. And I noticed as we were on the campus that we weren't, you know, really invited to participate in other things. Hmm. Everybody kind of kept us separate. So that's always been something I've tried to work against and help people understand, you know, why that needs to be different. So I really emphasize that a lot in my in my classes. And what's really great is my students, they see that too, the, the, the need for inclusion and how beneficial it is. So I encourage them, when you get in the field, make sure you're you're an effort, advocate for that too. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and you're modeling it. Well, talk about right. Canyon Inclusive Club. I mean, this, the name says it all. Yes, and this is great because it really stemmed from, you know, my students and something they wanted and were passionate about. A lot of them are coming to me saying, you know, yes, I, I definitely want to work with individuals with disabilities. That's why I'm in this program, but I'm kind of thinking maybe in a ministry setting. I'm like, well, that's, that's exciting. Let's talk about that. (laughs) So we started this new club where we connect, connected with different churches in the Valley. And we were in communication with the disability ministry directors about what events do you have? What opportunities do you have for volunteering? And um, we work with them to connect the students so they can go do that. And this last semester, we actually got to, as a club, go to a, a service at one of the churches all together and, and be there and observe. And then we got to talk after about what it was like. And so that was really neat to do that together as a club. Um, and then we've also worked with our um, Johnny and Friends office here in Arizona. They've come and done training with us and things like that. So it's been really neat to see the students just continue to foster this club and see it grow. That's really exciting. Your education goes way beyond the classroom into the communities and into the churches. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a model like that could really take fire if other universities could adapt that. I would love that. That would be fabulous. Yes. Hey, contact Dr. Rebecca Dyer for more information on doing that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, as we close our time together, can you share some last words of wisdom and encouragement for those who are listening and want to better include people with disabilities into their own lives, into their churches and communities? Yeah, definitely. I think the biggest thing is trying to focus on how can I understand their perspective? How can I understand what happens in their day to day? What do they need as they come to church? Kind of putting yourself in their shoes 
And then as you do that, making sure they feel loved and valued, both the parents and the families, and then obviously the kiddos as well. I mean, then build that trust and that relationship with them so that you can continue to get to know their perspective and continue to find new ways to support them and and love on them because each family is going to be very unique. So you really have to work on getting to know their individual needs. Mm -hmm. Great words. Thank you so much for all you're doing in the disability community and for impacting the next generation in the love of Christ. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for listening today. I loved hearing Dr. Dyer's passion for inclusion and some of the different models for inclusion that she's seen at various churches. If your church is interested in learning more about integrating kids with disabilities, adapting curriculum, or developing a hybrid model for inclusion, please visit johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast to learn more about our free church training resources. Our team has practical guides and hands-on tools for special needs ministry, and we'd love to connect you to a ministry mentor. Visit johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast to learn more. I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. And to get our next conversation automatically, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. I'm Crystal Keating, and this is the Johnny and Friends Ministry Podcast.